There's a, a worldly saying, the devil sometimes speaks the truth. And uh, we will see from the Bible this morning, that statement is, is correct. And if you have a Bible with you, I encourage you to open it to Matthew 4. Matthew chapter 4, I've been uh, privileged to, to uh, teach and preach a few lessons from Matthew, and it's, um, it's my goal to um, preach and teach through the entirety of this gospel account, and uh, I've made it to, to chapter 4. So if you've been here um, on Wednesday night Bible classes and a few Sundays, I've been, again, teaching through this book. And uh, I've arrived at chapter 4. In the beginning of chapter 4, we read, a, we read a context that many people will refer to as the temptation of Christ. The temptation of Christ. After Jesus was immersed by John in the Jordan River, the, the, Jordan River, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. While in the wilderness, uh, Satan appeared and he begins to put Jesus to the test and uh, I think it's quite interesting that Christ as soon as he begins his ministry and during this time of weakness because as we will read here in a moment he's been fasting for a long time so during this moment of weakness that's when the devil shows up right that is when Satan begins to tempt Christ and I think you know that in, in of itself is a lesson we can learn you know when we're we're feeling strong in the faith and everything seems to be going well in our lives. Usually that's not when we're going to face temptations from the world and from uh, the wicked spiritual forces in the world. It's usually when we're at a low point in our life and we're not feeling so great. Uh, that's when uh, Satan's going to show up to, to test us. Uh, we can learn from Jesus' example so that we can overcome Satan when he rears his ugly head in our lives. And so this morning we're going to review the three temptations of Christ and see what we can learn from them and see how he uh, responded so that we can follow his example. So we're going to review the three temptations of Christ and we start with the first one, right? The first temptation. So again, if you'd like to um, follow along, we're Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and I'm going to be reading from the King James uh, Version as, uh, as I typically do. <coughs> Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up from, uh, led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. He was hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. All right, so here's the first temptation. Here Jesus was tempted to satisfy his physical desires. And of course, you know, a natural desire we all have, that of hunger. And notice the, the period. It says he fasted for 40 days. That is possible, by the way. Uh, not too long ago, I forget his name. There's a, there's a guy who does magic tricks. He's like a magician. Uh, but he also just does like extreme stunts. And he actually did fast for 40 days uh, recently. So this is physically possible. You know, some people think, oh, that's not possible, right? It is possible, right, given the right conditions. You can fast for 40 days. But the number 40 is worth, uh, worth noting. Um, in the Bible... Sometimes numbers have, have a significance beyond just the number. And if you look at references to the number 40 in the Bible, it indicates a time of trial, a time of, of testing. The floodwaters rose for a period, the, the, the floodwaters of, of Noah's day, rose for a period of 40 days. Israel was in the desert for 40 years. Moses was on Mount Sinai, 40 days and 40 nights. When Jonah preached to the people of Nineveh, they were given 40 days to repent. And in the text in Jonah, it says, Jonah began to enter into the cities a day's journey. He cried and said, Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jonah 3, verse 4. So in the Bible, sometimes the number 40 just means 40. I mean, that's it. Um, but oftentimes, again, it carries this significance of 
a period of trial, a period of, of testing. And I would say we see that significance here, right? Because Jesus is being, he's literally being tested, right? He's being uh, tempted uh, by Satan. And so we're told that Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And not only does this signify a period of, of trial, um, but I, I believe it's also meant to parallel what Moses did, right? Because if you read the book of Exodus, when Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the law, it tells us he also fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And so again, there's I, th there's, I think, purposely a parallel that's meant to be drawn between Moses and Christ that we ought to view the start of Jesus' ministry, because that's what's going on here. The end of chapter 3, he's baptized. The Spirit descends on him. The Father says, this is my beloved Son. That's the beginning of his ministry. And so as soon as he begins his ministry, now we read about him being tempted. And so we ought to view the start of Jesus' ministry with as much significance as Moses receiving the law on Mount Sinai. You know, just as Moses was the, if I could use the term, central or main prophet and lawgiver for the people of Israel during the Old Testament, Jesus is that for us. Jesus is our prophet. He is our most important prophet and lawgiver today regarding the New Testament. He fasted 40 days. And if you look at the text and read it carefully, it says, afterward... He was hungry, right? That might seem kind of odd, right? We're, you know, a few hours away from lunchtime, and you might say, I'm already starting to get hungry, right? That's, that should strike you as a little odd, right? You read this, he fasted 40 days, and then it says afterward he was, he was hungry. Um, someone might, um, you know, wonder why it reads that way. And again, given this, this context, I do not believe this is talking about normal hunger, Right, you missed a meal or two, and your stomach might be uh, growling, and you know you might be hungry. In this context, it's describing an extreme hunger someone experiences when they're starving. You know, and and we I think have a tendency to um, speak in hyperboles or speak in extremes. Right, we might miss breakfast and say, "Well, I'm starving." Right. If you look up the word starving, it literally means like you're on the verge of death because you haven't. You haven't eaten in, in, in that much time. So this is, this is describing the hunger of someone who is, who is starving. And uh, I was listening to one preacher talk about this, and he said probably the, the closest comparison we could make is, like if you were swimming and you held your breath and you went into the water and you're under there long enough where you start to feel that painful urge where you need to get out and breathe, right? And he says this is the kind of hunger that Jesus was... Uh, experiencing um, at this time, right? He's fasting for 40 days. And, you know, once your body depletes all its fat, once it depletes all its extra reserves of energy, your body will begin to digest other tissues like muscle and uh, organs. And when a person reaches that state, that state of starvation, they will experience hunger pains. And in this sense, Jesus became hungry, right? He became uh, hungry with all capitals. And so think about this first temptation. And it, it seems harmless, doesn't it? You know, he hasn't eaten for 40 days, and here the devil says, okay, turn these stones into bread. And uh, again, it seems harmless. And uh, I've spent a long time often wondering, why would it, be wrong for Jesus to do that, right? Because he obviously needed some food, right? If you went without food for 40 days, do you think you'd, you'd want some food? And uh, I've often wondered, why would that be wrong? In fact, when you, you read through the gospel accounts, there are times people needed food. And what did Jesus do? He performed a miracle and gave them food, right? He took a couple of fish, he took some loaves of bread, and through... Uh, a miracle, he's able to multiply that and feed thousands of people. And so Jesus performed miracles to, to feed people. Why would it be wrong for him to, to do that for him himself? Again, obviously he needs some food, right? Well, consider the, the context. Let's, let's briefly back up to chapter 3, 
Let's look at the last verse in chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 17. Again, Jesus had just been baptized, right? He was immersed by John in the Jordan River. Verse 16, we read about the, the Spirit descending on Christ. Then verse 17, chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. All right, now immediately Jesus goes into the wilderness. The devil comes onto the scene. And what is the first thing the devil says? Going to chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 3. If thou be the Son of God. Right? So you see how that flows in the context? Jesus is proclaimed the Son of God, and immediately the tempter comes and says, If you are the Son of God, then you do this. Right? You turn these stones into bread. In all these temptations, right, and the word temptation here means, uh, means a test, right, a test, a trial. In all these temptations, Satan is challenging Jesus' role and ministry as the Son of God. And so we have to pay attention to the context here. You know, given these circumstances that Jesus was in, if he would have turned stones into bread to feed himself, then he would have been validating Satan. You know, Satan, Satan's actions in appearing to him and questioning him and testing him. And so this temptation gives us insight into how the devil works. And uh, this is a chapter or context, if you read it carefully, not only do we learn about Christ, which is the most important thing, but we can learn quite a bit about Satan as, as well. Uh, we should not be ignorant of his devices. Notice the first temptation recorded here is somewhat harmless in nature. Again, I think it would be we could easily argue on Jesus' Jesus's behalf and try to defend him if he again did turn stones into bread, right? He hasn't eaten for this long period of time. Obviously, he needed some, some sustenance. Again, we could uh, again argue on his behalf, try to defend him in uh, making bread for him, himself. So this first temptation seems again, somewhat harmless in nature uh, that we could easily argue on Jesus' behalf. And I think this is often how temptation starts, that it starts with something small. It starts with something that seems harmless, even beneficial at first. And think about people today who commit you know, really hardened acts of sin. People who commit uh, violence, murder, uh, who, who uh, betray some kind of secret trust, uh, people who steal from others when they don't need to steal. You know, people act that way because before they get to that point, they've made 100,000 other small choices which have compromised their integrity. And just as Jesus did not give in to this seemingly harmless temptation, right, turning stones into bread to feed himself because he had, hadn't had any food for 40 days, just as Jesus did not give in to this temptation, neither should we give in to small temptations knowing that it can lead us down the wrong path. And so again, he wasn't going to validate uh, Satan in, um, in, in any way. Um, and he was not going to use uh, his power as the Son of God for selfish purposes, even if those purposes, again, were um, harmless or even necessary. Jesus could have responded to Satan in, in several different ways. Uh, he could have just ignored Satan. Uh, he could have rebuked Satan just as he rebuked demons. He could have told Satan to go away. Right? Which he does, by the way, as we reach the end of this passage. Eventually, he does tell him to go away. Right? However, each time, as we look at the beginning of this, this context, each time Jesus was tempted, he responded by quoting Scripture. And there's a lesson in that for us. Right? Each time Jesus was tempted, he responded by quoting Scripture. And this teaches us not only about the power and authority of the Word of God, but how it becomes useful, right? This is only useful when you know it well enough that you can repeat it and live by it. 
All right, so can you look at Jesus? He quotes from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. And just as a side note, he, all his quotations come from the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, he quotes from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. And that's found here in verse 4. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, where Christ responds by saying, it is written. And that's a, a normal uh, formula in the Bible for offering a quotation. And we'll see that in the context. So he says, it is written, meaning he's going to now quote something. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Right, and so now he's, he's quoting. He's quoting scripture. Again, that comes from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. So not only did Jesus refuse to validate Satan in any way, but in experiencing this extreme level of hunger, he can sympathize with the poor and downtrodden throughout the world. The King of kings and Lord of lords knows what it feels like to be so hungry that he's, he's actually nearing death. No person can accuse Jesus of not sympathizing with humanity. And so not, as, not only is that a humbling thing to think about as, as Christians, because we are followers of Christ, and we see Jesus subjecting himself to this extreme level of, of, uh, of, uh, of um, I want to say poverty, but it's not poverty, of... Um, you know, not sustaining himself, of not eating, right? And he's doing this for, again, a purpose. But again, this should also be a, a source of encouragement um, for us um, because we serve a Lord who knows what it's like to experience the low points of life. Uh, and he can understand and relate to us in everything that we go through, whether we're doing well for ourselves and we never worry about food or someone who's not doing so well, doesn't have so much money, doesn't have so much food. Jesus can relate to us all. And so the devil did not give up with this first temptation. As we keep reading, now we read about the second temptation. All right, so continuing with verse 5, Matthew chapter 4, verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, so again, here's this testing again. It's, it's all focused on who Jesus is as the Son of God. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. And watch what the devil does here in verse 6. He says, For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And so here Jesus faces the temptation of, of pride. Right? The devil, um, either liter literally or in some kind of vision, takes Jesus to one of the highest parts of the temple. And the temple was at a very uh, high location because on the side of the temple there was a, a valley. So very high up. And Satan, in essence, if I can just uh, summarize, it says, throw yourself off the temple because God's going to take care of you. After all, you're the son of God, right? If you're the son of God, throw yourself down because he's not going to let any harm come to you. So again, he's, he's being tested again. And I want you to look at verse 6 and notice what Satan did here. Satan quotes Scripture. And think about that. Satan quotes Scripture. And if anyone would like to take notes, we're not going to turn there for time's sake. But the quotation he gives is from Psalm 91, verse 11. Right. So if you look at verse 6 where Satan says it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee and so on. That comes from Psalm 91, verse 11. And if you have a Bible with references, likely that's in the, the reference column. And again, this is an important lesson that we can learn from this passage and that we can apply. Anyone can quote scripture. The devil can quote scripture, right? And just because someone is quoting you a Bible verse doesn't mean they're correct in what they're saying and doesn't mean you should follow what they say. 
right? Well, if you say that's that's the case, then what are we doing here, right? <laughs> because obviously I'm reading the Bible and we all you know pay attention to Scripture. Well, in short, here the devil is taking this verse out of context, right? He's taking it out of the context of, of the Psalm in which it's found, and he's taking it out of the context of the entire Bible. You know, sitting here quoting the Scriptures is a case of the right information, but the wrong application. And once more, notice Jesus' response in verse 7. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Right? So in response to Satan quoting Scripture, Jesus quotes Scripture. Right? And again, there's a lesson in that uh, for us. So again, if you like to take notes here, uh, the quotation here that from Jesus is Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. Now, it is not the case that one verse in the Bible is somehow more important or you know, trumps another verse. So like we can ignore that verse because this verse seems better to us. Right? That's not the case. That's not what's, what's going on. Uh, Jesus here is quoting scripture to show that the devil is using the Bible incorrectly, right? There's a correct way and an incorrect way to use the Bible, right? One of the images of the Bible is that of a sword, right? There's a correct way and an incorrect way to use a sword, right? You don't want to chop your own head off with a sword. That would be the incorrect way to use a sword, right? There's a correct way and an incorrect way to use the Bible. And again, think about what the devil is doing. The devil, in essence, is telling Jesus you can go ahead and test God. You can tempt God. Throw yourself off the temple because the Bible says God's going to take care of you. You know, here's this verse in the Psalms that God is going to take care of you. So go ahead and put God to the test. And yet the Bible clearly says, do not test God. Again, that's, that's the whole reason Jesus is responding to how, again, the devil is incorrectly using Scripture. The Bible describes two groups of people. And this is the biblical language. The, the Bible calls some people children of the devil and others the children of God. And those who are children of the devil follow the example of their father, Satan, by trying to use Scripture against Scripture or use the Bible to contradict itself. Let us avoid this bad example and instead follow the example of Christ, having confidence in everything the Bible says. And so when the Bible says, do not test God, we can know that when there's a verse that says something like, God's going to protect you, that doesn't mean we can just create dangers for ourselves and then do that test God and think God's going to take care of us. Right? We should not test, uh, test God. All the Bible says, uh, goes together harmoniously. So again, Jesus quotes scripture, and uh, once again, he overcomes Satan. Again, Satan is persistent, and he, he doesn't give up, and now we read about the third and final temptation at this, at this time. So let's continue with verse 8. Chapter 4, verse 8, <clears throat> says again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. And that's the King James, a newer translation. He just says, Go away! <laughs> right? So here finally Jesus does say, Go away. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. So here's the final temptation at this, this point in time. And this is the temptation to seize power. To seize power and glory for oneself. Now I'd like to point out how Satan is described here. Again, we can learn some things about Satan, which is, I think, important. Right? We should know who our enemy is. 
Uh, if we go back, quickly go back to verse 3. According to verse 3, what is Satan called here? The tempter, right? And when the tempter came to him. Now, this isn't necessarily a name, but even proper names, what a person is called in Scripture is important because it often signifies who they are or what they do. And really, none of these things are names. The devil, Satan, these are all really descriptions. And uh, I took the time to look up the term tempter there in verse 3. And this word can signify testing someone with hostile intention. Right? Testing someone with hostile in intention. That is who the devil is. That is who he operate, how he operates. And that's what he's doing here. Right? We can test people. We can test things for, for good reasons. But that's not what he's doing. He is testing Jesus because he is hostile to him. And he is hostile towards, tho towards those who are going to follow Jesus Christ. And what a person is called in Scripture is often important, even a proper name, like Jacob. Right, if you go back and read the Old Testament, the name Jacob has significance. And there's a reason his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. Right, names have, have significance. And if you look at again, what he's called, he's called the devil. And if you look up the Greek term, it's uh, diabolos. And uh, that's where we get words like diabolical, right? So not a good word, right? He's called the devil. He's called diabolos, which means a false accuser. He's also called Satan, which comes from Hebrew. Satan or Satan uh, means an adversary. So again, the text is describing who this entity is, right? And Satan is not just a metaphor, right? The Bible teaches there is a spiritual world a spiritual realm where there are beings that are created beings that are under the authority of God. And there's all kinds of different names. There's angels, there's cherubim, there's demons. Uh, Satan would be one of them. And so, again, this is who he is. This is how he acts towards Christ, how he acts towards humanity. He is someone who is going to test us because he is adversarial to us. He is hostile to us. And he is a, a false accuser, right? He is someone who speaks lies, often contradicting and misleading people, uh, not giving the full picture, right? Just as he would quote from Psalm here, trying to mislead uh, Jesus. Uh, same thing he did with Eve, right? Calling to question God's, God's words back in uh, the book of Genesis, and so he tempted Jesus by offering him all the kingdoms of the world. So again, I mentioned before when he was taken up to the, the pinnacle of the temple, that, that could be like a, a prophetic vision. And uh, I think this is the case here when we look at this uh, final um, temptation. If you look at verse 8, it says, The devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world. And as far as I know, there's no mountain high enough in the Bible lands where you could see all the kingdoms of the world. So again, this is likely like a, a vision that uh, Jesus was, uh, was shown. So here's the temptation that, that Christ could have worldly authority. He could be the king of it all, right? Have power over it all, have the riches of it all. And Jesus again, did not give in to this temptation he did not abandon the heavenly kingdom for an earthly kingdom, and neither should we. You know, later on, as we read in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew 6, verse 33. That's what Jesus preached, and that's also what he practiced. Right? He was not going to seek something other than the kingdom of God. Now, again, I want you to notice here something regarding Satan, which is significant. Look at verse 9. And it's, I think it's good to dwell on these details because the Bible doesn't speak a whole lot about Satan. Right? And so when we have these, these passages which are kind of dense with information about him, we should really take the time to learn about who he is and how he operates. So look at verse 9. He saith unto him, all these things will I give thee, all these kingdoms will I give, give to you, Jesus. Verse 9, he says, if, right? So here's the conditional, conditional promise he offers. If thou wilt fall down and worship me. 
So again, this provides us some insight into the devil, who he is, uh, his character, what he desires. He desires worship. Again, think about that. That's, that's significant. He desires worship. Not only does he want Christ to bow before him and be submissive to him, but he wants that from everybody. And if he wants that from Christ, he's going to want that from, uh, from you. He desires worship. You know, every functional, healthy adult worships someone or something, right? If you take the time to look at the word worship, it's the same root word as the word worth or worthy. So whatever you think has value, whatever you think has worth, and that's where you, that's where you put your time and energy, that is something you, in essence, worship, right? And every person operates that way. There's very few people who are genuinely nihilistic, thinking that you know, nothing matters, there's no meaning to anything. There's very few people who actually live that way, and, because you can. And uh, I have a book about philosophy, it's really interesting, and it talks about uh, nihilism, and it actually speaks about those who are, who are truly dedicated to nihilistic beliefs, which is the idea like nothing matters, nothing means, there's no meaning to anything. Uh, people who truly believe that go crazy. They literally go insane. Because again, you can't function that way. You can't get up in the morning and, and make yourself breakfast and take that and, and digest it and do all that thinking there's no purpose or no meaning to anything, right? Uh, you have to, to believe in some kind of, of you know, baseline meaning uh, in life. Um, otherwise, you're going to go literally go crazy. Um, can everyone who gets up and lives what we might call a normal life, get out, of, get, get out of bed, go to work, do things, interact with people. Everyone believes in something. There is no such thing as, as a, again, a, a, a no belief system, right? Again, that's the, the few people who believe that who go crazy. And you know, some people believe in a particular philosophy or religion like us or a set of principles, or a worldview. There's all kinds of names for it, but everyone has some kind of belief system. Right? Everyone has some kind of belief system. And the Bible teaches us that Satan is behind worldly belief systems, manipulating people and tempting them to believe in lies instead of believing the truth. And uh, I mentioned before, the Bible talks about those who are children of Satan and those who are children of God. And here in 1 John 5, 19, it says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. All right? 1 John 5, 19. The world here, meaning those who are outside of Christ, those who are outside of the gospel, again, they're under the sway, they're under the influence of the devil. And may this serve as a reminder that as followers of Christ, our values are separate and distinct from other belief systems, right? From, from atheism and postmodernism and, and um, other Eastern religions like Buddhism and stuff like that. Our beliefs are different from all those things. If Satan is bold enough to ask Jesus to worship him, be assured he wants the same thing from you. And uh, mark my words, I'm not talking about someone who goes and joins like the Church of Satan, right? Or some kind of like crazy pagan cult or something like that. Those do exist in the world, but, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, people glorify the devil by simply continually rejecting Christ, right? Rejecting the truth, rejecting the gospel uh, system, the gospel message. And uh, again, one more quote from, from 1 John. It says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. He does not continue, continue in sin or make a habit of sin, as some translations will say. It says, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And then notice in the next verse it says, in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. And the thought continues. So again, those who are children of God the seed of God remains in us. The seed of God referring to the Word of God. And so the Word of God remains in us, the, the Word given by the Spirit. And uh, we are not people who just continue in sin unashamed, unabashedly. 
Again, that is, that is the distinction here offered between those who belong to God and those who belong to the devil. And so we, can you think about who the devil is and how he operates? He wants your fealty. He wants you to be committed to him, not to Christ. He wants you to believe in things other than the gospel. Again, worldly systems of, of belief. Now, once more, Jesus responds by quoting Scripture. If we go back to verse 10, he says, Go away, right? Get, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. So once again, here's this formula. It is written, letting us know that he's quoting Scripture. And so again, if you like to take notes, this is a quotation from Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So again, what are some lessons that we can learn from this context? And I'd just like to uh, reiterate just a few things, and the, the lesson will be yours this morning. You know, when you face trials, let's not forget Jesus faced trials as well. You know, I've heard, you know, as a preacher, I hear all kinds of stories. You know, I listen to a lot of things, and I don't always remember where I, you know, pick up these things. But, you know, I've, I've heard some people respond if someone's, facing a very difficult situation where there's a family member who has cancer or has some kind of terminal illness and, and people have asked, well, where's God in my life when that's going on? And I've heard the response, well, he's probably in the same place he was when Jesus was being crucified and tortured and, and facing death. And so we have to remember that we serve a Lord who sympathizes with us, who, who knows what it feels like to be human and face weaknesses like Something as basic as, as hunger, right? Jesus knows what it means to be hungry. He knows how it feels to be rejected. He knows how it feels to, to, to lose a friend or lose someone or something which is valuable. And so as we face temptation, let's follow the example of Christ by enduring those temptations and also relying on the Word of God. And so let's follow his, again, follow his example. Another lesson that we can learn from this passage is that we can overcome Satan. Right? Now, it wasn't, I think, easy, but Jesus did overcome Satan. And in James 4, verse 7, again, this is something that we're promised as well. Uh, in that verse it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So we're told here, if we resist, again, the devil, he will flee, he will go away. Now, with this in mind, let me just quickly offer this word of caution. We can learn from this context, the devil is persistent. And uh, if we go to uh, Luke's gospel account, because Luke also records the uh, temptation of Christ. In Luke 4, verse 13, it says, When the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him, and notice this word, a season. Right? He departed for a season. Right? A season meaning an appointed time which comes to an end, right? Just like we have four seasons, right? You know, spring is going to come, it's going to begin, but then spring's going to end, right? It's going to end, and then we're going to get into summer, the next season. And uh, I bring that up because the, the point here is that the, the devil did not leave Jesus permanently, right? He left for a season, meaning that he's going to come back, and he's going to tempt Christ again when he can. And uh, there's other translations which will bring out that meaning a little uh, clearer. The New King James says he departed from him until an opportune time. So we should understand that here in Matthew, this is not the totality of, of Satan tempting Jesus, right? This is just one period of time, right? The text says he's going to come back again when it's convenient for him. And so, again, I think there's a lesson in that, that we have to always be vigilant, uh, knowing that as long as we are in this world, we are strangers and pilgrims, and that periodically our faith is going to be tested. Right? We are going to face times of, of trial in this uh, life. And so let us learn from the example of, of Christ. He teaches us how to, to cope with times of, of testing. And as I wrap things up this morning, I just want to point out one last thing. Go back to verse 6. You know, recall, quickly recall this verse that Satan quoted to tempt Christ. Going back to verse 6, right? It says, it's written, he shall give his 
angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, at least, at least at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Right? Just in brief, this verse says, angels will take care of you. Right? So he's using this verse to, to test Christ. Jesus remained faithful, and when this time of testing had ended, when the devil left, what does the text say? What's that last verse we read? Verse uh, 11. Last verse in the context. Verse 11. The devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. As I mentioned at the, the outset, the devil sometimes speaks the truth. Right? But the truth he spoke, again, it wasn't accomplished in the way the devil wanted it accomplished. Right? God's promises are received through faith, right? They're not received by demand. They're not received through trying to manipulate God and mess around with the scriptures in a, in a, again, a manipulative way. Christ remained faithful. He endured difficult times. And then when, again, it was the proper time, he received that promise, right? The promise of receiving the aid of angels. And so may we endeavor to follow the example of Christ when we feel like we're going through times of, of testing, let us continually trust in God, trust in his word, and know that God is faithful to his promises, but God is going to accomplish his promises through faith and through uh, his, own, his own schedule, his own proper time. And so again, we have this, this great example in Christ and overcoming Satan and overcoming temptations, remaining faithful and in the, in, in the end receiving the blessings and promises of God.